Hi, this is Lincoln Goins. I'm here with John, and you're watching For Bass Players Only. Hi everyone, John Liebman here. You're watching for BassPlayersOnly.com. We're coming to you today from the campus of Berklee College of Music in Boston, one of my favorite places with one of my favorite people, longtime Berklee professor Lincoln Goins. How you doing, Lincoln? I'm doing great. Great to see you. Great to see you too. How many years have we tried to get this interview to happen? I don't. I, I think that interview that initially we did, where you sent me the questions, I think that was maybe 2008. No, that was 2012. Oh, I looked. So I read a question. Okay, <laughs> all right. I wasn't trying to put you on the spot, but anyway, we have corresponded like thousands of times via email, and whenever I think we're going to be at the, in the same place at the same time, you're busy, and uh, we, we just haven't worked it out. So I'm glad to see you. I'm glad, glad you're here. You. Well, I always feel like I'm in touch with you because I always, you know, see your little blurbs and interviews, and I get, you know, lots of stuff from you, you know, interviews by email, and it's great what you're doing. Well, thank you. Now you'll be the, the, the blur. That's my little oh. promotion. Well, t effective today, you'll be the, the blur B. I'll be the blur B. Right. <laughs> oh, I'm going to do that later. Okay. <laughs> okay. Let's talk about you and bass and stuff. Sure. Uh, you, I was reading the interview last night. You were originally from, you are originally from, was it Oakland, California? Oakland, California. And then you went to high school up in Vancouver? Uh, I went to high school up in Vancouver because my, my two older brothers were draft age during the Vietnam War, and my dad... Uh, got offered a job up there, and he wanted to take us uh, out of having to um, be eligible for the draft. So he, he was a civil engineer, and he worked up there uh, for British Columbia Hydro. And I went to high school up there, and that's where I actually first started playing the upright bass when I was in Vancouver. Well, what attracted you to the bass in the first place? The sound of the bass, the sound. I, I always, didn't matter what the genre was, I was always drawn to the the placement of the bass and the structure of what it was doing. and particularly the upright bass and the sound it just really touched my heart well between your dad and your brothers and any of your other surroundings were you exposed to any particular style of music or did you just well, I'm a child of the 60s I was exposed to pretty much everything that was on the radio at that time which was everything from from Jimi Hendrix to James Brown to uh, to the Beatles to uh, and and all, all of the music that was happening in the 60s, which was, you know, obviously a very rich culture of music. Um, in addition to that, my father was a music lover, and he listened to classical music, and I got exposed to the Bach cello suites and, and all the classical repertoire. And I, when I first started, well, I first started playing electric bass, uh, listening to the psychedelic bands from my... Um, from my from the Bay Area, right. Jefferson Airplane, yeah, like Moby Grape and Quicksilver oh. Messenger oh, Service, Quicksilver yeah. Messenger Service, yeah, Jefferson, yeah. Airplane. Jefferson Airplane, Jefferson Airplane, Grateful Dead, uh, and Jimi Hendrix and all that kind of stuff. When I, you know, when I was um, going into high school, I have a picture somewhere that my wife took. Yeah, I was picture me with hair. No, <laughs> I was standing <laughs> on a newspaper box under the street sign at the corner of Haight and Ashbury. I have Ashbury. to dig that out. So Haight and Ashbury, that was the summer of love. I was there for the summer of love. I was in the, I was in ninth grade. I'll have to ask my wife where that picture is. We'll have to dig that up. <laughs> but but bass was your first instrument. Bass was not my first instrument. I started out in the piano like uh, all my brothers and sisters. Uh, that didn't really last too long. And then I got uh, into the trumpet, and I was sort of serious about that through grade school. And then when I was about 14, 15, I uh, started getting into the psychedelic music, listening to the rock bands, the Beatles, the Jefferson Airplane, the Cream, Jimi Hendrix, and I wanted to play bass. Gotcha. That's what got me going on the I bass. Think, I think Chuck I had a lot more hair then, too. <laughs> I think Chuck Rainey and I think Mark Egan didn't they both start out on trumpet or and Will was it Will no Will Lee I think started on the French Mark horn Mark Egan for sure yeah yeah but I can say that uh, Jack Cassidy was one oh, of my yeah. m first influences I didn't really even realize that it was him but I I liked the way that he sort of I didn't know it at the time but he was playing like sort of a four note jazz pulse within the context of of of, of a rock band. And I, 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 I learned in retrospect that that's what had touched me about what he was doing. Yeah, I, I like Jack. I, I did a couple interviews. Actually, the last interview I did with Greatly Jack. Really underrated player. But uh, Jack was sitting on my right, and Tim LaFave was sitting on cool. my left. It was before the Tedeschi Trucks Hot Tuna uh -huh, Wood uh -huh. Brothers concert. Yeah, yeah. 
Uh, so how did your career get rolling? And I, I want to ask, ask you specifically, and this may be two different questions, okay. but you're, you're heavily into the, the Latin and the funk and the Latin funk thing. I remember working out of your, your book with Robbie Amin, the, the book you, you co-wrote with Robbie Amin, Funkifying the Clave. Clave. And actually, you know, I just wanted to mention that I do a lab here at Berkeley called Funkifying the Clave, which is loosely based upon that concept with uh, Professor Mark Walker, uh, who's a drummer. Who, who is very proficient in, uh, in the Afro-Cuban style, and also is sort of a kindred spirit like me, where I, I, sort, of, I sort of feel like I, I have a, I'm able to be fluid in a lot of different styles. Because I lived in Miami for six years, uh -huh. so it was, it was kind of obvious for me to be exposed to that. But up in Vancouver or up in the Oakland area, how did that make it? Or was that when you went to New York? Or how uh, did, you know, how did that come to be? Sort of, I, I, I always had an interest in Afro-Cuban music and Latin music, Brazilian music. Um, I think when I came to New York, it sort of solidified uh, because of the cultures there, uh, you know, the Latin culture there and the Brazilian music culture there. And it was one of the things you had to do to get a gig, you know. If you could play a tumbao, you could get a gig. It didn't matter where, you know, where your, where your background was from. So I didn't really um, make a distinction. I just, you know, like, oh, this is some, something that I really would like to learn how to do to make this kind of pulse and, and, and get that heartbeat going. Did you have anything? I think I asked you this in the previous interview. Probably. But did you have anything in New York lined up or did you just... Go for it. I just went out there with a band. Um, I was playing with a band called Night Flight, which was sort of like a Sergio Mendez Brazil 66 style fusion band with vocals. And the drummer was getting married, and we decided we were just going to go out. Listen, I was young and fearless. I was 22. I had, I had no fear, you know. And I just went out there and did it and dove in. And it was, there was a scene there, and I, and I made it happen. Obviously, you did. Well, how about the upright bass? Were you playing a lot of that in New York as well? I was. I was. I actually played more upright. Um, I always considered myself a doubler. I didn't really get serious about the upright till I was about 17. I started taking classical lessons, and I learned how to play with the bow. I did a little bit of orchestra work. Um, and this was right about the time where I started getting into jazz. And there was a point there when I was about that age, when I was about 17, where I thought maybe I was going to go into the classical field and, 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 and become a legit player. But then I heard... Can you uh, still use that word? Because that used to upset a lot of people. When oh, well, <laughs> I, I apologize for that, but that's the word. Don't that apologize to me. But I'm a dinosaur. Sorry. Um, there, I, I can cite a couple albums that I heard. You know, I'd already had the rock background. Okay, that was there. And then I started getting interested in the classical, but there was... Uh, a Love Supreme by John Coltrane mm -hmm. with Jimmy Garrison playing bass yep. and knocked me off my knocked me off my chair when I heard that. Also uh, Bitches Brew, Miles Davis. Mm -hmm. Those two records. Uh, were there the was, there was more than one with Dave Holland and weren't there some others on that? Dave Holland played bass on that. Uh, there was another electric bass player who played on that too. Yeah. I should know his name. Wasn't Steve Swallow? No, it wasn't no. Steve Swallow. No. Wasn't Steve Swallow. Okay. Well, we'll look that up. We're going to look that up. Yeah, I should know that. I apologize to the bass world for that. Hey, you mentioned bow. I always have to ask, bow, French bow or German bow? French bow. French bow. My, my, uh, my teacher, Sidney Keats, played French because he was a cellist and a bassist, former principal of the Vancouver Symphony, mm. and I started on the French. Okay. Also because, you know, I, I, I'm sort of on the short side. I'm sort of like an Eddie Gomez-sized guy here, and I think it's better for short arms. I was just about to ask you about Eddie Gomez. You have some kind of connection to him, I don't do you? I do have him. I study with Eddie uh, informally. I took private lessons with him uh, on and off uh, back in the 70s. You know, he came to Vancouver and played with, uh, with Bill Evans' trio, and I went up on a break, and I said, hey, can I come to your hotel room and get some lessons? And he said yes. Wow. That's how I met Brian Bromberg in 1984 when he came through Miami with uh, Bonnie Alexander. And, and he was sharing a, a hotel room with uh, Bobby. Who was the percussionist? Oh, geez. Bob, Bobby Thomas. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But uh, Eddie Gomez, I was at the International Society of Bassists Convention in New York at, uh, at NYU in 1990. Uh -huh. And he gave a master class. Uh -huh. And I went up there and I played something at, at the master. The first thing I said, I looked out of the audience. I said, is there anybody out there who's 
not a bass player. And one guy had his girlfriend there, and she was the only one. In the <laughs> but I played the thing, and he was he was really just so gentlemanly and so giving and so kind. I just have a, a really I've, I've tried to reach out to him in the meantime since I started the site. Haven't gotten that interview yet, but uh, maybe you can help me. You know, this the name of the bass player on Bitches Brew, the electric bass yeah. player. It, 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 his name's on the tip of my tongue. Maybe yeah. we could take a break, and I can go find it. Yeah. We'll figure it All out. Right. We'll figure it out. What is keeping you busy these days? Well, I do a lot more teaching now than I do touring, and that's not, it's more by choice than anything else. I've, uh, um, I'm full-time here at Berkeley, and it's a, it's, a pretty, uh, it's a pretty busy job for me. Okay. What can you tell me about the, uh, you've been here a long time. You haven't been full-time for all these years, but you've been around long enough to be able to, to assess. See, one thing about this, I was in the school business. This is my 10th year here. Okay. Yeah. So one of the first things I learned, I was in, in higher education for 26 years. One of the first things somebody told me was, every year we get a year older but the students stay the same age. <laughs> so it's almost like a Mr. Holland's opus. What, what, what could you share about the, the changes in attitude or expectations of students, if any? I mean, 10 years ago or however, they all, did they all want to be this, and now they all want to be this? And I know they, that some want to be Billy Sheen and Victor Wooten, and some are, uh, you know, want to be Lee Scla or Abel Boreal, or some have their own thing. But in that spirit, what can you share about this evolution of these new crops that continually think, come in? Okay, I, I think trends change, and 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 you know, uh, interests of students change. But my role essentially does not change because my I'm I'm there to help them with their foundational skills. Whatever you're interested in, whatever you whatever artists influence them whether I know them or not you know unfortunately sometimes I don't and I have to I have to familiarize myself with it but they still have to learn how to play scales they still have to learn how to groove they still have to learn how to read they still have to learn to to, to do things that bassists have to do which is play their instrument well and listen and be the heartbeat of the band and that's never going to change so my role essentially does not change even though that the interests of the students may change. So that's what I have to say about that. Okay. Do they seem to have realistic expectations, or do they? Th you know, I, I bet a lot of them think they're better than they are, and mm. some of them probably are better than they think they that's are. That's a loaded question. <laughs> uh, well, again, I say my job is to, to to give them a realistic vision of what they need to do to improve themselves foundationally okay. in all the aspects of what you know their groove, their improv, their uh, you know, getting familiar with all styles and not just the one style that they're comfortable with. Yeah, that's that's an important one. Very important. Let me ask you this: at the risk of having you repeat yourself, let me see if I can narrow it down okay. a little bit because we, we've been run. I started for bass players only in 2009, and okay. we're primarily known for our interviews. We've got right now somewhere between 600, 650 interviews, yeah. oh, 651 now. And uh, and we're also becoming very well known for the online bass instruction mm -hmm. that we have. Yeah. So for our members of the instructional part of for bass players only, a, a lot of them tend to be a little bit older than your typical entry-level student. They may okay. be in their 50s and sure. 60s. Sure. They've always wanted to do it. Now they're finally going to do it. What sage advice, words of wisdom can you impart to somebody who wants to learn to bass? Something, whatever you do, make sure you do this. Or whatever you do, make sure you don't do this. Is there anything specific you can impart? Well, first of all, I'm going to say it's never too late uh, to learn how to play the bass. Um, I think the most important thing a bass, bassist can do, regardless of, you know, your age or what level you're at, is to learn how to listen. Because the role of the bass is to, to guide the whole band and, and to be able to listen. And not just be um, stuck with just playing the instrument. You know, it's, it's, for lack of a better term, heads up. Learn how to play heads up. Learn how to play and have one ear listening to to what's going on around you in, 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 in terms of guiding the ensemble. It's crucial. It is. Tell me about your gear. Well, I play Federa. Uh, I haven't really changed that. I'm sort of satisfied with what they give me. I got some very nice basses by them. You're primarily a five-string player? Five-string. I got uh, one fretless five-string and two fretted five-strings. One is a 33 and one is a 34. Oh, 
that's right. And the 34 doesn't have any preamp in it. It's the first one they made for me, and it's a beautiful bass. Sings like a bird. Yeah. And, you know, I, I wouldn't normally have to ask this question, but nowadays you can't even assume. I assume that the fifth string is a low B, right? Low B. Okay, because it's yeah. it's surprising to me how often it's it's still the minority, but I've I've talked to a lot of bass players, a handful of bass players. Harvey that, Brooks. Harvey Brooks. That's the bass player. <laughs> I just remembered. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. To, I'm sorry to mess. <laughs> you're you're right. How okay. am I doing? How am I doing? <laughs> you're doing great. Okay. Um, it it struck me odd that there are people that opt for the high C yeah. a, a, instead of the low B. So that's why I had to ask. Well, my choice was to go to the low B. I like the option of having a low string to do what a keyboard can do. Um, and to do what a bass player should do. Well, do what a bass player without abusing the privilege of having the low notes. Um, and for me, it was difficult because I had to uh, I had to make the adjustment from the four to the five on the fly. So I would be on stage, for example, with a guy like Mike Stern, where I knew his music from memory, and instead of going for a G, I played a D. And I did that several times, and he was not amused. We've all done that. <laughs> But I figured it out, and I'm, I'm glad I, I made the adjustment. It was not like I could stop playing for six months and come back. And I, I did an interview, and I mentioned this a few times, with uh, Pete Griffin with the Generation X okay. Tour. So it was it Steve Vai, Yngwie Malmsteen, uh -huh. uh, Zach Wilde, and, and uh, with Nuno Betancourt, and one, uh, one other person. I can't remember. But anyway, he had two fours and two fives, and this one had this kind of tuning, and this one had that tuning, and the effects. And I said, my God, you got to really concentrate and focus on, on all of that so going from a g to a d sounds almost minor when you uh when you think of it in that context well i think you know for myself with all the switches and dials and pedals i i never i spent some time with it but i basically feel that it, you know in my heart i'm an upright player and i i try to emulate that sensibility of of wood and and fundamental note uh, even when I'm playing the electric bass, my uh, my Fodera basses are set up very simply. It's just one knob, on and off. Well, actually, the, the 33 has a preamp in it that I preset. It helps enhance the sound a little bit. Yeah, I like that. I like things simple because as far as the gear stuff, most most of the time I just don't get it. What kind of strings do you play? Uh, I use Fodera strings on my electric basses and Labella on my upright basses. The labella. Who was it? Uh, Buster Williams, I think, or somebody that, that I think Ron Carter also. They use the the labellas on yeah, the upper. Yeah, I don't use the the kind that Ron uses. I use a uh, um um, not not the black tape ones, but the regular light gauge labella strings. Yeah, great stuff. Great, what a, excellent. Yeah. How about amps? Uh, Epiphany. Okay. Right, and I also have a Walter Woods. Ah. Yeah. Who is the? Is it Ed Lucy? I think here has a Walter. I have a Walter Woods. Yeah. I bought it in 1980, wow. and I still have it. I love it. And I was just, I think it was James Genus I interviewed, or somebody that said, he, or maybe Miles Mosley. He has a Walter Woods also. You don't see too many of those. Yeah. Um, and any effects, or you're, you're pretty no. 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 What about the future? What else is in store? You're in Berkeley. You play here. I, I, we didn't even ask you about Dave Valentine. We can talk about that next time. We'll do a follow-up interview. Sure. But sure. What, what's coming up that you know well, of? Well, i got you some gigs coming up with uh, Michelle Camilo, mm -hmm. Bill O'Connell, pianist. I play regularly with the Portinho Trio. Portinho is a master Brazilian drummer in, in New York City. Right. Uh, and I still do sessions and, and you know, when they come up and... Uh, but mostly I'm a professor here at, at Berkeley College of Music. Well, good. Let me ask you one more question. I know what it is. What is it? <laughs> what would I do if I wasn't a bass player? Can I answer the same one that I did last time? I, I remember what it was. Sometimes people give me the same answer. Sometimes they give me a different mm -hmm. answer. What would you be if you weren't a bass player? Well, I'd probably be a Tai Chi teacher. But, you know, actually now I am a Tai Chi teacher because I teach Tai Chi at, uh, at the college here. It's one of the courses that I teach. Uh, in addition to that, I've added on boxing training. So I don't know, you know, I, I, I wouldn't say I want to be a boxer, but uh, I don't know. I don't know how to answer that. I think really. that was your... I can't think of life, life without bass. I mean, what kind of a yeah, question is that, John? That's Come right. on. That's right. <laughs> well, keep playing the bass then. I will. Uh, I will I, indeed. Uh, Great to see you. Lincoln, thanks so much. Great seeing you too. Thank much you. luck. Continued success. Okay. Keep doing what you're doing, and we will all keep enjoying it. 
on location at the Berkeley College of Music with our good friend Lincoln Goins. I'm John Liebman. You're watching the essential site for all things bass, exclusive one-on-one -on -one bass player interviews, and now more and more people's favorite site for learning bass online. That's for bassplayersonly.com. Once again, I'm John Liebman. Let's play bass. <laughs> Thank you. 